Uh, Igor, thank you for joining us this afternoon and taking the time to speak with me. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this film, The White Fortress, is getting uh, just a slew of accolades, and all of them are absolutely deserved. Congratulations on such a wonderful film. Um, this is the second time that you've been selected by TIFF for Canada's Top Ten. Uh, and this movie in particular was Bosnia's entry for consideration for the Academy Awards. What does that sort of recognition in both uh, Bosnia and Canada mean to you? Um, it's, I mean, it's always, it's always humbling when you make something that uses the creative capacities of crews from both, you know, Canada and Bosnia. Um, and there's, and both sort of recognize some merit in it. Um, like it, it, I wasn't exactly sure how this film would be entirely received, uh, especially in Bosnia, um, just because, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not that it's a controversial topic. It's just that it, it's a topic to create, I think has a lot of sort of emotional, um, uh, uh, sort of sensitivity, like, you know, the portrayal of young people in the sort of post-war space. And there's this delicate topic in the country where, you know, not enough uh, attention is being put on it uh, with young people essentially not having much of a future uh, as, as it's currently constructed. And, you know, they're leaving in, in, in very large numbers or they're massively underemployed. So, you know, young people either quit schools or if they do stay in school when they graduate there really aren't many prospects for them so it, it's it's a it's a, it's an annoying topic i think for a lot of people in bosnia uh, in particular so i tried to use uh the the situation in the country as as a way to uh kind of construct this story about you know class dynamics and 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 young people that are kind of that fall into these two extremes uh, in the sort of post-war um, kind of wild uh, Bosnian setup that they have going right now. Um, and it kind of going back to the Canadian component. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a film that in many ways would not have happened if it wasn't for sort of Canada joining this organization called Your Image. Uh, it's an organization that allows you to collaborate and co-produce with uh, other countries. So Canada historically had like a lot of collaborations with uh, English and French speaking territories in Europe. So, you know, Ireland was a common co-producer, uh, co uh, France, Belgium, but a lot of the other countries were not sort of natural uh, co-producers. Um, so what this sort of allowed is for Canadian uh, production companies to co-produce films with uh, technically any European Euromage member. So that's like, I think at this point, it's like almost 40 countries. So that, that includes countries that are in the European Union and countries that are not part of the European Union. So this in effect became the first Canadian Bosnian co-production uh, because uh, the 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 emphasis of this particular uh, body is to to incentivize collaboration between these different states, and this was a this many many ways this project was not getting the support in Bosnia uh, from funders. So um, when Canada became interested, uh, suddenly Bosnia became interested as well. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, there are a lot of threads in there that I want to pick up. Um, and I think maybe I'll start with, so this film is very much as much about Sarajevo as it is about the, the kids. Um, and your previous films have also drawn from your Bosnian roots. Why is it important to you to return to Bosnia in your storytelling? Um, I mean, not all the films I've done, but most of the films I've done kind of tackle that topic. Um, I think in some ways, some of these films are sort of had, have been in development for a very long time, right? So they, they all kind of existed in this period in my filmography that I would say like, you know, six, seven years that I was actually developing them. And then it might have taken a bit longer for them all to come out. So I call this sort of phase, this sort of, um, you know, processing trauma or, or like art therapy in many ways. Uh, I was a child of war that sort of 
I was a refugee for about a year before we immigrated to Canada. And um, that process was never fully something I kind of wanted to deal with uh, until early 20s. And I think the what I found was um, sort of the, 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 the need to tell stories that tie uh, myself on a, on, a, on a narrative level uh, to Bosnia and Sarajevo. And I found that element, that dialogue that I needed to create uh, between my birthplace and, and, and my work was a necessary sort of step in, in, in sort of the evolution of uh, the kinds of stories I want to tell. Um, and I think the most successful uh, filmmakers are the ones that kind of, you know, they spend time with ideas and stories that 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 they know they can tell like they, there's an authenticity to that um to the language that they're using to the to the topic that they're interested in and then that can kind of evolve into like a, a host of uh different sort of trajectories uh that that they might you know use those uh, the things that they've learned from those from that those early films to um uh, to tell stories that are not necessarily tied to that space um, I want to ask you about the Bosnian film industry. We have a lot of um, international films in our festival, um, and we talk to a lot of filmmakers about the struggles that Iranian filmmakers have um, producing their films and getting their films uh, distributed. And obviously, with the Canadian co-production here, it's a little easier. But what is the Bosnian film industry like when you decide to put together a project? Um, is it comparable to Canada? Is it harder to get projects made? What's the um, market share for Bosnian films, uh, as it were? So, I mean, it's it's quite small. The population is very small and it just keeps declining. So there are fewer opportunities than Canada to make films. Um, on average, you have anywhere between sometimes three films supported or made in a year, sometimes you have six, like it really depends. And then it's a host of, then you have some documentaries and short films as well. Um, and then in terms of uh, funding possibilities, films are quite, it's quite an underfunded space. Um, and the politics make it quite fragile, like the culture scene is quite fragile because of these kind of ethno-politicized narratives and like some of the, sto some of the stories that are being sort of told, like they, they always uh, create these camps of like whether things should be funded or not. Um, and even though the jury is supposed to be impartial, there's always things that kind of complicate how things are adjudicated. Um, and but the good development now is that there's a lot of uh, um, sort of uh, uh, private uh, uh, sort of communication companies and, and uh, uh, telecommunications companies that are trying to, well, they're not private, they're actually public, but uh, they're trying to kind of invest uh, in new work and in particular episodic work. So something that hasn't really existed before. So you have this, the, the professional sort of um, uh, crew that's there, they work on the local stuff, but they also service a lot of productions from other countries that, that, that just choose to shoot in Sarajevo. Um, and, you know, they're working on like a, a tax credit scheme in the country to kind of like attract uh, productions. So there's, um, there are things that are happening that are quite good that are kind of uh, designed to make it an attractive space. Um, Sarajevo is unique in, in Bosnia in that it has so many different kinds of terrain over a span of like 200, 250 kilometers, right? So you can have from deserts to to like you know tundra to mountains to um, uh, it's it's sort of like the it's it's like a much less developed Switzerland in many ways in terms of like what the geography that that's on offer um, plus that kind of far more arid kind of Mediterranean climate that that some parts of Switzerland also have um, but it it's it's still like in its infancy in terms of like what it could be um but one unique kind of feature is because it's so small um the crews are quite good like you have people who you know in a given year are going to be on like you know upwards of 10 plus productions and that affords them like a level of of um sort of uh 
experience, it's sort of hard to come by uh, in equally sort of sized uh, spaces. So it's like working there is is because I did work there uh, on a short film I did called Woman in Purple. Uh, people can can find that on on uh, on YouTube and Vimeo. It's an omelette. So it, it's um, uh, it's a space that I find uh, I've gotten used to working in um, just as much as I've sort of worked in the Canadian system. And in the Canadian system, I've mostly done sort of independently minded projects, right? Like we're talking about films that are under one million dollars, right? right. Um, so it's 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 a it's it's like it's still it's still sort of like I guess non-union. <laughs> Uh, very, very small scale kind of uh, 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 approach. Um, even though you had, you know, quite quite sizable crews, it's still uh, I, I couldn't I couldn't really compare the the two spaces in that way because I have never done anything in Canada that's like that that, that would be considered medium budget or, or or bigger budget. Is there any sort of like because wasn't it back? before the wall fell that like Tito would would let American productions come and, and film because they That's had right. all this surplus uh, um, uh, Russian military materials that they could use in, in like war movies and stuff like that. Is there any sort of like longevity of uh, like people who worked on films back then that kind of created the film industry in, in the area? That's a good question. That's one of the best questions I've had in a long time. Um, so that's like a very complicated answer because it is many countries now. Right. So yeah. you just like the irony, like of this, this, this co-production treaty that Canada has signed with, with, uh, uh, with the former territories, uh, that made up uh, Yugoslavia is they're still using the co-production treaty signed in 1988. Okay. So like the treaty, like the countries that inherit that treaty are like Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Slovenia, Serbia, Kosovo uh montenegro uh macedonia right yeah. so you have all these countries who are in theory able to co-produce with canada still using this 1988 document right and and um likewise just like canada co-produced with yugoslavia and then, like a lot of tv shows were shot like in you know just like game of thrones is shot in croatia a lot of tv shows before were also shot in croatia right <laughs> like canadian tv shows and american shows so so you had you had this system that was sort of inherited by these um, other other sort of uh, by the countries that 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 uh, uh, gained their independence from from socialist Yugoslavia. So you you don't have necessarily the 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 people that are around as much as you do have the sort of the uh, the history, right? So right. a lot of those sort of famous uh sort of the the red westerns that were made the partisan west the partisan films the sort of like yugoslav state sponsored uh star vehicles they would often have like hollywood actors attached in key roles but they're essentially films to like you know rally the uh uh sort of the yugoslav identity but also the sort of um uh, fight against nazism that happened in 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 uh in in in, in world war ii so these films ironically enough are under threat some some are i don't think they'll ever be able to like recover them mm. some are quite well preserved i would say others less so so the irony is that as the state collapsed the way that everything kind of fractured like the way that knowledge got fractured the way that uh these assets got fractured has been quite complex right. like the legalities of like this studio, even it's like one director, the studio owns one of the one of one of his films in Zagreb, another studio owns the other film in Belgrade, another studio owns it, another film in Sarajevo, right? Right. So it, it became quite complex to kind of um, uh, deal with this. There have been attempts to to um, to consolidate these libraries, right? Like various kind of services that kind of uh, create this uh this sort of appreciation of like this easy use lot films um but the knowledge of like how to work you know in the system with other western sort of actors 
um, or producers um, is quite different because this, this sort of the state under Tito was able to sort of, you know, the, 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 like I thought it was a joke, but it's, a, it's no joke. Um, there, was a, there was a talk I was at about 14, 14 years ago now, like 2008, and um, uh, Lustig, the, the, one of the producers of Schindler's List, who was like of Yugoslav descent, um, he said, I was asking him like, you know, like how, 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 how do you, like, how did you like, you know, get tanks or whatever? And it's literally just like a phone call the day before. <laughs> and you would just have reservists coming in, thousands of them to be part of the back backdrop. Wow. So it was like quite easy to, to, to achieve. And sometimes they would do it for like art films. So like, <laughs> so somebody would need like, there was this one famous film that almost got some filmmakers in trouble where they, you know, they made the troops do all sorts of like ridiculous things. And then, and then they kind of put them in this sort of experimental documentary. So like you, the state did really want art made. Mm. Uh, they rarely censored it and any attempt to censor it would actually increase the intrigue okay. had about the art. So like, it was a bad thing to censor. Um, right. There was one filmmaker that did phase jail time. He made Plastic Jesus uh, as a thesis film. So like there was one instance of a person actually facing jail time uh, during that entire thing. So there were quite, there were films that were sort of propaganda films and you had art films and then like sort of everything in between, um, um, like sort of mainstream, like sort of uh, uh, escapers, right? Mm. Um, and there was like a, pretty massive film industry when you consider the size of the country um and they the, the longevity of those films in the in the eyes of the west um isn't there even though they do feature some fairly substantial actors in them um but they do exist and are fondly remembered and you know are pirated a lot in places like China and Vietnam in Iran, right? Which is, right. which is fascinating. Like there's some films, some partisan films that are like part of like the, the sort of the Chinese kind of cultural zeitgeist, huh. uh, like Walter defense Sarajevo, that film that's in this film, it's featured yeah. in this film is like one of the best known films, uh, from that era in all of China, they have brands dedicated to it. They have beers dedicated to it. So that's so strange. That's and, and yeah. so wonderful and amazing. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's like a complicated, there's, there's just so much there. Uh, but like the, the sad reality is that a lot of these films, um, are like, you know, the best copies that exists for some of them are like VHS level right. kind of, uh, recordings that, and there is film of them, but I'm not sure if, if, if you can restore all of them because Avala film kind of just bankrupted and you know all these archives in belgrade i'm not sure what's happening to them right now um i don't have that information but it, but the bosnian film archive bosna film like i believe they have been trying to kind of uh restore them and sort of put them in like air con you know air conditioned air air, right. air air controlled rooms right but um it really depends on who is in charge because what happened in the fall of the the fall you know, when the curtain fell, Yugoslavia wasn't part of the Warsaw Pact, but it was affected by the by the by the fall, like you know the rise of uh, the fall of socialism and sort of the uh, the opening of of these sort of democratic democratic processes, right? Um, to 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 um, just gave rise to a lot of ethno nationalism, mm -hmm. and these they they were sometimes not interested in protecting this heritage right like they right. they they kind of like let it get moldy let the let the film emulsion get moldy like we don't care right so so that's essentially what's uh happened since uh it really depend on who was in charge and how they felt uh this 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 these archives these thousands of films that were made uh should be preserved or shouldn't be preserved you got more than you asked for with that. Oh, no, that's a great answer. The only thing I can think of that, like, and you know, this has happened in a lot of places, especially where where you had communist uh, governments that that fell. But also, I'm thinking of like Britain 
in the 60s and 70s when they would just record over um things because they only had so much film so, much and so there's right. oh, there's just so much especially like early bbc content that has been completely lost because they recorded over an episode of something with a news broadcast because they had to um and then it's that's just a, that's like the war in bosnia so the local tv stations would air stuff because like you would you would have the electricity occasionally and the antennas would be working occasionally so you would have a report and I was asking, uh, uh, when I was making the short film, I was asking the archivist there, like, do you have footage from the war? They're like, we have only so much because we kept re-taping re over these programs as the war was happening. So like some people did, and I found a few of them, did record with a VHS, with their VHS player, this original newscast. Right. That's only been recorded by a handful of people if they <laughs> happen to like have electricity at that moment in right. the war. And press the record button on the on their VCR player, and that's like broadcasting is like a different animal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like those kinds of situations uh, that you that you mentioned, sort of like BBC going through, sort of like you know they don't have enough tapes, so they just keep recording over it. Yeah. Because TV was seen as a, a sort of expendable, right? Like the, the it was never seen as something that that's everlasting. It's fleeting. Whereas film was always seen as like something you need to inherit and protect. Right. These like you know these like these these uh, this old stock these these old um, um, sort of air controlled uh, rooms that need to be you know protected because there's a generation coming up after us that might want to look at this on on a, on a both as a level uh, the level of nostalgia but also the level of research. And um, the sad reality is that even the Canadian archive system, I don't know if you know this, they, they went under, under Harper, but they went through a system of essentially dis destroying some archival uh, stuff because they just didn't have like the, the space for it. Like it was too expensive to store it. So this, this was about 10 years ago now um, where they, there's actual things that even in the Canadian system has been lost, like old, whether it be old photographs, old like uh, newsreels, old government records. I don't know about government records, but like the 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 um, uh, the, the the rationale was that they they are um, uh, too expensive. So some of the stuff has been digitized that was deemed valuable, but even these digital records, I'm not sure how how uh protected they are so like it's a huge topic it's like a fascinating topic how do you archive like things that have been created in, in different cultures and different contexts because yeah. in some ways like putting on youtube is a safe it's pretty it's like it might be a good idea to just like put 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 stuff on youtube just and, ho yeah. and hope it like kind of even as a private channel and just hope it just kind of exists in the cloud um for as long as it does exist yeah <laughs> It's 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 that that argument of you know if you digitize things well then you need servers to ha have the digitized stuff right. on it and and what happens if a fridge magnet gets attached to something and it wipes something out but uh, it, that's all so fascinating um, so let's talk a little bit about the the film uh, so you've described White Fortress as a coming of age romance that adopts the trappings of a fairy tale while functioning as a mystery thriller. And there's an awful lot to unpack in there. So um, where where did the story start for you? Because uh, you both wrote and directed the film. Uh, so how did White Fortress come about? It essentially started by me spending time in, in Sarajevo, uh, like talking to young people, talking to their parents, um, just sort of like, what is this post-war Sarajevo like? It, like that journey for me began in 2007, really. Um, and then subsequently in 2009, I shot a short film called Woman in Purple, which I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And that sort of opened up these, these questions, like what happens to these young people, many of them who maybe only grew up with one parent or no parent after the war. Um, and then because the project took a long time to get off the ground, I had to update it so that it reflects this even younger uh, group of uh, people that were born not, not right after the war, but quite a few years after the war, right? Like now that we're born anywhere between like five or six years or seven years after the war. Right. Um, so their take on this reality is even more removed from, from the 90s. 
Um, and what I found is that things that really haven't changed that much, right? Like technologies have changed. There's like social, the, the advent of social media and like, you know, this, like since 2008, 2009, just like, just like here, uh, you know, this, this idea of Facebook, Instagram, this kind of, this, this presence of, of like, um, uh, pressure that's kind of created through that. Um, but also this pressure that's created when you have these sort of social media outlets, but you don't have a clear out, like you don't have your dreams are stunted in a way because you know you can't achieve certain things you've sort of accepted the parameters of of, of, of that society um so while you kind of subconsciously dream you 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 consciously know that things aren't that great over the horizon especially if you, if you stay there so um that's sort of what's been that's what's inspired me like like meeting young people who are, i said you know for for years leading up to that to that to the filming of the film they're like well, i'll never leave the space like i love the space so too much and then a few years later they're in germany or you know or they're 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 in uh, the uk or they're in canada right like they just don't see a way through um and bosnia is a very complicated uh, country, right? Like it's it's it, the the peace treaty that's been created there through the Dayton Accords is it's an imposed solution, right? Um, that doesn't actually allow give you human rights. Like it's no, it's not it's human rights in the in the sense in how we understand it, right? Like you only gain full rights is if you identify with one of the three ethnic like ethnic groups like as one of the three constituent people so like you are not guaranteed you know uh the the, the right to uh political participation at certain levels unless you identify as one of these three ethnic groups and this they won a they won like court cases against the bosnian government at the eu courts or rather the european courts but it doesn't matter because this is so entrenched and there's signatories involved the us the eu uh there's the co like in croatia and serbia because croatia and serbia it like kind of stir the pot as well like they do not want meaningful reform in the system either right they, they kind of have their own political interests they they draw upon the voting blocks within those countries who have dual nationalities so we have parties that benefit from like these people who have dual nationalities and can, 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 can participate in the elections in Bosnia and in Croatia and Serbia. So, you know, and a lot of people in Bosnia are already EU citizens, right? Quite a few, right? right. So, so it's, it's a very strange, it's a very strange <laughs> mixture of interests and, and, and dysfunctions that are not just internal. Like we, we kind of, it's, it's really easy to blame um, a space for their problems when the solutions and and often the fighting was caused by external forces, right? Or was was uh, precipitated, was made worse by external forces. So it's it's it's, it's a strange, strange uh, conundrum of of of, uh, uh, sort of consequences that people are still feeling today and. Uh, it doesn't seem like things are changing in a, in a good direction right now, especially with what's happening in the U Ukraine and Russia. And there's just like more tension in the region. Yeah, I can, I can imagine, I, you know, there's there's no such thing as absolute parallels, but you know, what's happening in the Ukraine and seeing the the amount of refugees that are streaming out of there, it, it does call to mind what was happening in the 90s and, and mm -hmm. the the, the refugees as yourself uh, included, you know, trying to find safe haven in Europe and in other countries. Um, and it's, is there any sense in the country of, as you say, maybe the conflict is still so recent that that first generation that's been kind of born after the conflict isn't old enough yet, but like any sort of progressive movement or, or attempt to like, replace people in power like younger people coming into politics and trying to to institute reforms or anything like that 
I mean, you have like civic minded parties that are sort of like looking at reforms, but they don't have the the ability to make the reforms in anything anywhere outside of municipalities. So let's say you have a, you have like a canton and there are certain reforms that have been made around language, right? The language there, it, they cl classify it as three different languages, right? But they're all speaking the same language. Right. I'm, a, I'm a, like a, a lot of people don't know that, but um, like Croatian, Serbian, and and Bosnian, they're they're same language. Right. They're just called these things depending on where you live or depending on what your ethnic group is. Right. It all used to be known as Serbo-Croatian, like in the in the old in the olden days. And uh, but now, like for for example, like only a few years ago, when you put your child in the school system, you have to you have to tell the instructors like what standard you want to use. So there's certain words and like phrases that might be used more often in Serbia, or like the the child should be writing in the Cyrillic alphabet if if they want to be graded using the Serbian sort of curriculum or like whether they should write in, in the Bosnian curriculum or the Croatian curriculum. So you have kids, for example, who live in Sarajevo, but happen to watch, you know, uh, dubbings in Serbian and or Croatian. So they pick up these words, right? right. It's like, we don't, we don't use that word here. So like the parents get confused and like, why is my son using this Croatian term for this? So they finally like, fine, like, cause there's so much mixing. They're like, there always is because they listen to each other's music. They, they watch each other's TV shows. It's like that player hasn't changed. That's the thing. Like they, they compete. You know, there's like the American Idol. They have like right. a regional program, and they all they compete in. They're like, they speak in the same language, and they compete in these in these programs. So you're like, of course they're gonna pick up these words, right. and 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 they finally like allowed for this this sort of, sort of like open way of uh, you know the parent can finally choose like our language essentially it's just the combination of the three. Right standards um so you can you can you can mix it up so when you say you know um obitel which is a, which is just with instead of uh, familia so obitel in, in croatian means family and familia it means in bosnian right like you can use either now right so 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 like these little kind of phrases that 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 are you know more used in one region than the other and sometimes the regionalisms are not tied to ethnicity they're tied to geography right so like it gets very complicated so there are some there's some positive changes at the municipal levels in various parts of bosnia but as a whole i haven't seen um like i don't i don't see a mechanism in place uh that's that's going to work until also Croatia and Serbia and the international community really kind of uh, sit down uh, and figure out a, a way forward. Um, because right now this entrenchment and this kind of the flare ups that happened from like Dodik, but also from uh, the various actors in Europe and and in Russia and the way they've kind of created a lot of tension in the region. Um, but also the tension that's created through uh, sort of the inaction, right? Like the US and the EU in some ways, sometimes you wonder like they, it's almost like they don't want this country to function. They, they like the destabilization. They like the, you know, they get, they get military bases there. You know, the US has their kind of entrenchment there too. Like there's so many forces at play that are quite complex uh, as to like why a region should and shouldn't function self-determination isn't on the table you get yeah. to be as stable as we want you to be sort of but it's thing. also like even even though the people that live there are south Slav, south slavs they're all south slavs because the demographic shift the biggest group is bosniaks they're muslim and the idea of like um the idea of like a muslim state having self-determination in europe is is scary to some people, right? Right. Even 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 if this form of, this form is quite banal, it's like it's not. We're not talking about an Islamic Republic here. We're talking about right. just people that happen to be culturally Muslim, um, and 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 you know, they some of them express it, some of them don't, so some of them are secular. So it, it's it's like it's a palatable form, but even still, 
the name is enough to to make people take action against it that's um i i just i keep thinking about and i've heard that mentioned in circles like from i'm not going to say who i've just heard it mentioned through uh by people in power um uh, in other countries this idea this fear yeah right it's it's a, it's a and, and 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 by not allowing this sort of self determination like you are you are adding to this fundamentalism it's not like it's not like you're creating a safer space by not giving people agency you're actually creating a more dangerous place by not allowing for agency right right yeah. by creating these gridlocks so that the country doesn't function so that you have these these kind of ethnic rivalries and ethnic nationalism that just kind of maintains the status quo but for whom you know the right. people there are benefiting people that, that kind of have created this peace 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 uh, arrangement were the same people that fought right like they're the ones that were fought in, fought in the war so they clearly right. have an interest in maintaining that because that's how they derive their power but right. like when you have other actors outside of the outside of the country also kind of feeding into this tension um it becomes it becomes um you start to question, you know, how both meaning is created and how conflicts are created, you know, how they're reported on, how, you know, you know, peace is created, how wars are created, for whose benefit and in what way. Um, like what's happening in Ukraine right now, it's 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 heartbreaking and the idea that there could not be a dialogue between these parties is is kind of bs it's the fact that there you know so many countries have even tried to like have a dialogue right um is is a problem right like there's, there's a creation or an assumption that like you know these there is no dialogue to be had right because you know the objectives that they have are completely you know anthema to our objectives but the people ultimately suffering are the people in that war zone it's the ukrainian people yeah right like they're the ones that are that are suffering especially ukrainians in the, that are like suffering in you know south of danipur like the eastern ukraine so it's like and the refugees that are like being created you know um uh, throughout europe and uh, the world and many who will never go back like there's this assumption that like we'll they will go back they kind of help these economies they help the west in some ways right like mm -hmm. and europe and the us and canada on some level are still quite racist so you know the way that the yugoslav populations were accepted and the way the ukrainian populations are accepted in some of these places is not the same uh when you look at how the middle eastern populations or the north african populations were accepted right so like is it like some demographic thing is it whatever it is it's 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 like we need to open our eyes to these complexities and you know stop the sort of uh flag waving because that's not going to change the narrative that is not going to kind of um move the needle in how we engage with these spaces especially post-war environments like bosnia because nobody cares anymore right like like bosnia hardly ever makes the the, the headlines Right. And I think that's kind of one of the reasons that uh, our programmers kind of fell so in, in love with this film is that Bosnia is not necessarily a country that you have many preconceptions about. And so then seeing such a beautiful, but also such a, a stark and clearly presented picture of, of, you know, the struggles and the, the divide that's happening uh, in that country and then from the perspective of you know young kids that are in love um it's just so um so gripping and it's obviously having a a positive response with with the audience and uh, we can't wait to show it to ours um igor thank you so much for for taking time this afternoon to speak with me uh, of course been... thanks again for for showing the film and i wish you luck with the festival